everybody's got their favorite part of the cycle. There are people that love the wash, they love the rinse or the spin or the drain. I'm a spin guy, I love the spin. There it goes. My name is John Charles and I'm a washer collector, uh, enthusiast. Laundry day. <laughs> The club got started around 1987, I think, and now we have like 3,000 members from all over the world. But we get together for wash-ins. You do laundry till like four in the morning. You do your margaritas and your laundry together. The laundry. The laundry. The laundry. We watch the cycles. You'll see a lot of us just stand there and watch the whole cycle go through. Oh, oh my God. Get everywhere. All 3,000 of us come in with a story like, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only person in the world that did this. In the collection, I've got 59 machines and I've got 22 hooked up and running down here in the basement. I have a good representation of everything that was made from 1938 to today. And I take them all apart and I restore them because I want to know how everything works inside the machine. And then the laundry is, for me, it's sort of like the frosting on the cake. These machines represent a lot of ways of doing things in each decade that change, that we no longer do. And I think it's something that should be preserved for other people, if we can get them interested. I just can't go to a cocktail party and say, how's your washer doing? They'd look at me like I was crazy. But I can get together with these guys, let my hair down. Uh, it's just so much fun to be able to have a conversation about it, because I know laundry's a chore for everybody else, but for us, it's, it's play. Collecting milk bottles, following brown road signs, spotting village water pumps, taking pictures of tombstones, appreciating roundabouts. These are dull things to do, aren't they? Welcome to the Dull Men's Club. I am Grover Click. I'm Assistant Vice President of the Dull Men's Club and one of its founders. The Dull Men's Club is a group that get together to celebrate the ordinary. Yeah, it began in the 1980s, a long time ago. We began in, in New York City, and later I moved to London, and the Dull Men's Club followed me, and it's grown here in England as well. It's got members both in England and America and across the world. The last time we did a roundup, putting all, all things together, it looked like we had about 5,000 members. So here are the people that do things that some people think are dull. Here's Steve. Um, I'm a milk bottle collector. I have some 20,000 milk bottles from not just the UK, but all over the world. Germany, France, South Africa, Hong Kong, Portugal. I've got Iranian bottles. Uh, I don't like milk at all. I just don't like it. <laughs> Sorry. And we have some women that are interested in the Dull Men's Club. Here's Amanda. My quirky hobby is randomly following brown tourist signs. Yep, you heard her right. I get inspired to turn off the road whenever I see one, and I find it very hard not to. I follow brown signs around the UK and indeed the whole world. So I've now been to thousands and thousands. We also have a member that appreciates roundabouts. I'm Kevin and I'm the president of the UK Roundabout Appreciation Society, also known as Lord of the Rings. That's my official title. I have taken thousands of pictures of roundabouts, even when I'm abroad on holiday. I know a lot of people would find my hobby quite dull. But it's bright being dull. It's sexy being dull. And next is a member that is just dying to get into a graveyard. I'm a tomb traveler and I take pictures of famous graves around the globe. Uh, probably over the years, four or 500 uh, on various parts of the world. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Bruce Lee and Brandon Lee, Elvis Presley, Ludwig van Beethoven, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, well, I don't feel that I'm a dull man, but people have said that, but I prefer to think that I've got a rounded hobby and interest. It takes my mind away from work. And we have Dick, who's spotting village water pumps. And it all came about through accident. Ten years ago, somebody pointed out a tiny little pump by the side of the road, and almost every village we went through, I'd say, there's a pump, and we'd just slam the brakes on, jump out and take a picture of the pump. It's okay to be dull. There are a lot of studies being done now that Boredom has got benefits. We're not so interested in the glitz and glam. We're quite happy with simple things in life.
The very first time I left the ground in a gyroplane, I knew it was over. I, my life was done, it was all gonna be about gyroplanes. And it was not just because I was in the air, but I was depending upon myself, so my safety was in my own hands. It was one of the most exhilarating sensations that I've ever received in my life. My name is George Jacob, and I'm known as Gyro Jake. I build gyroplanes from scratch. What a gyroplane is, basically a hybrid airplane, helicopter, but it's neither of the two. How many gyroplanes? I would say I built close to 20. I lost count around 13 a few years back. I imagine what I want and what components should fit together. Then I machine out and weld up the parts that are necessary to get the job completed. So sometimes it can take two months, sometimes it can take a year. And there's times I look at it and I go, man, I did that and it works and I'm gonna fly it. Staying inside the fence, touch it goes. When I first started, it was a pretty small clique in Florida. And so we'd get together on the weekends. Today, the gyro community is probably increased by a hundredfold, especially with the new revolution of the factory built gyros. To do it yourself, builders are kind of like the dinosaurs. They're on their way to being extinct. There aren't many people that spend most of their free time building a gyro plane, one after the other after the other. There's no incentive like money that compels me to do this. It's just because this is my pleasure, this is my joy, this is my passion. Football is the most popular sport in Sierra Leone. And in the city of Freetown, there is one very special team. Meet the Flying Stars. My name is Mohamed Lapia. I play for Salon Flying Star and Petit Football Club. I play the attacking role. Mohamed grew up playing football. But when he was only 10 years old, he stepped on a landmine and had to have his right leg amputated. And unfortunately, Mohammed isn't alone. The Saloon Flying Star and PT football team, now wall affected and PT blood and so so did it. Every member of the Flying Stars has lost limbs as a result of the violence that occurred during the Civil War in Sierra Leone. But the players don't let their injuries stop them from getting into the game. Because who they play, they were really rough. Them coaches, they the jump. They were really rough. Then they play with one foot, one leg. My name is Baitawali. I mean, the coach for the Flying Star Amputee Football Club. Presently, in a free toy, na 30 players. Eight. Nine, ten, now. Well, really, we will be train full time. We go. We will train throughout the week. We go. Hey, stay. Well, really, we can, we can train. We get a cone there, we can put. We get some strength dribble there, we do. We get less short, uh, short run and uh, do that and short kick, long kick, penalty shootout. I will see like same thing normal, like how they able to do. Play on. Change, change, Evan. Not only is it a competitive sport, it is helping them cope with their injuries and overcome the stigma that's associated with the disabled. You know this, this discrimination on this, on this country who offend himself. We need to do something with the make. We forget about the problem. And what better way than football? I like football, especially the amputee football. Don't change my life. They don't make an illegal street for good big. Don't give me a word of courage. Not to not only me, they come to play at them. I think a lot of people look at hula as just women dancing, but um, we love it, man. Hula is a story. To tell the story the way the ancient Hawaiians did, you really need to put yourself in that dance. You need to live like them. 
You need to chant like them. You need to train like them. Basically, you need to become them. Halau is a hula school. We perform all over the world. In ancient times, warriors are actually recruited from the halau. The chief would come to look, and from the ranks of the advanced male dancers, warriors were selected. The philosophy of our halau is to kind of replicate that. For male hula, we're basically telling warrior stories. And to dance like a warrior, you need to train like a warrior. We train in a private piece of land on the west side of Oahu, using only what ancient Hawaiians had. Whether it's rocks, the sand, the ocean. When we come to practice, we expect to die. It's strenuous on the legs, but it's also to train your mind. I tell myself and the rest of the boys, if I fall, it's because my body just gave out. One of the hardest workouts we do would be climbing the coconut tree. Sometimes you reach the top and your legs are shaking because you know, you're holding your weight. And to look down, knowing that nothing's holding you, you gotta kinda have this warrior mindset as like, you know, that this is what I want, you know, I'm gonna get this. You know, when these gentlemen come to hula, they're like a ball of clay. As kumu, I look at it as my responsibility to shape them into better individuals. Better fathers, better sons, better brothers. Our goal is that when these men are done dancing, that they leave here better people. What hula does for me culturally, it still takes me back to, to how Hawaii used to be. People sometimes are losing that aloha for each other, that love for each other. And hula just gives you that reality check, man. I'm dancing until my kneecaps fall off. And even after that, I'm gonna do whatever I can for the halal. You know, we have this brotherhood where we take care of each other. We help push each other. It's my passion and I, I look forward to seeing where Hula takes me in life. <laughs>